All right, so today's video, we're watching TikToks. Reacting to TikToks is always a good time. But today, we got a, a bunch of TikToks again to look at, react to, have a good time. We'll put all the, the links to these in the description so you know where to go. Uh, and yeah, let's see what we got first here. We got rare Overwatch 2 voice lines. If this is one where Widow has to hit a shot, then that's probably going to be a rare voice line because I don't hear that too much. Okay, here we go. Rare Overwatch voice lines. Well, let me start from the beginning. Rare Overwatch voice lines. Here for you, Spider Queen. You're powered up. Get in there. Nano hits. <laughs> There's really no difference. You're powered I actually haven't heard any of these. Moira, we must replicate this nano boost. from above. Two Amaris foiled at once. Oh, okay, I get it. Get in there. <laughs> Your mom helped me do that. I do like that there's nothing ruins a big moment like a rifle stuck to the teeth. This is also this is this is also live ranked footage. Anybody's wondering, this is all in people's rank games. Oh yeah, Wrecking Ball is always just roasting people. You ever notice that with Wrecking Ball? Wrecking Ball just absolutely roasts people the whole time. Let them out. I've got you. I just want to play racket ball now. That's some tech. Yours isn't half bad either. It's hand. Line them up. Knock them down. That's pretty cool, actually. I see some of those voice lines. I haven't heard like many of them. I guess that's why they're called rare Overwatch 2 voice lines, right? It makes sense because it's a rare Overwatch 2 voice. Like, yeah, I haven't heard many of those. I, I, I've never heard the Wrecking Ball one with the one where he's like calls him a nerd. Let's see what the next one is. Is season nine Overwatch's last hope? With season eight being overall quite lackluster and the fact that most players say that it's a buffer until season nine, it begs the question to say that if season nine fails, is that it for Overwatch? As we all know, tons of massive changes. I'm going to pause very quickly all, uh, already on this one. I, I feel like this discussion comes up pretty much most Overwatch seasons since the beginning of Overwatch 2. I will say this about Season 9. I think Season 9 is a very important season for Overwatch. And a lot of the reason behind that is just to why it's like a very important season is because they're finally kind of addressing the kind of ranked issue of not having a good feedback loop. And I really believe that a good feedback loop for Overwatch and ranked is important. And Overwatch 2 has lacked that since the beginning of Overwatch 2. There's been great videos on it. We're like, and uh, SK had one of the, those great videos where she talked about like, if you go, you know, one in six, you know it's not going to be a good result anyway. So it's a very important season on the rank side of things because ranked has always been, you have to wait so long to get any feedback loop. And if at any point you've already hit four losses, five losses before you get your rank update, you pretty much know it's not going to go well. And on top of that, having the hidden MMR system on that code, right? Having the hidden MMR system, which which for people wondering what hidden MMR is, like your rank that you have on your screen is also different from what the game has you. So if you've ever played ranked and you go like five and three and then you D rank, or you go five and two and you D rank, that's because your hidden MMR isn't lining up with what they're showing on your screen. So even though you're getting a positive result from your games, you're still getting like negative feedback than what you would normally get. And that's all an issue. I mean, obviously that's gonna change going into season nine, but a little bit of a side note, because I don't know if they'll talk about rank in this TikTok, but yeah, I think it's, I think like season nine will be very important for that side of things, especially. Changes are coming to Overwatch in season nine. Between ranked updates, Good. massive hero changes, and much more, it seems like the fate and future of Overwatch relies on the success of season nine, which is why a lot of people are questioning that if season nine fails, is the Overwatch community just gonna throw Overwatch in the trash? What do you think? How long has it been since you've played Overwatch? And is the success of season nine going to determine how much you play Overwatch in the future? Well, I feel like that would go for any season, right? It's like, just to kind of go back to what we were just talking about right there, to give you an example, I Basically, each season's gonna have that, right? I call, I kind of call them hype cycles, especially in like um, I call them hype cycles in uh, free to play games. Essentially, in free to play games, if a season is very intriguing, people will play that season much more than they will if the season is a bit more of what is considered filler or um, not as exciting, right? For example, season eight, even though it had a new hero and um, is usually like their very much their their bread and butter seasons, ended up being a season where people kind of just chilled a little bit because they're so amped up for season nine, right? So the discussion of like, will people base it off of how season nine is and play it less or more? I mean, that's going to happen regardless of how it goes because it's the hype cycle of of new seasons. Do you get what I'm saying? Whenever I see something like this, though, it's like I, I played Overwatch once, so I don't... <laughs> 
I say that in the sense that, like, I got to see this game not updated for, like, three years. So I, I just, I see that. I, I'm like, you know, I think I, people will still play it regardless. Uh, I think Season 9 is very important on the rank side, specifically. And you said Fortnite doesn't have a filler season. All of them are top tier. I, so I can't necessarily speak on that completely, but I do know that Fortnite's had, like, some seasons where people are chilling a bit more, as far as I understand. Fortnite has amazing, like, collaborations. But, I, I mean, I just even knowing some people who have, who played a ton of Fortnite. I think they can have a similar issue, though, if people don't like the play style of that season. But keep in mind, I can't really speak with Fortnite on that one because I just don't, I don't play it a ton. I, I, for me, when it comes to Fortnite, I'm just glad people have a game they really enjoy and have fun with. That's kind of how I always end with games and stuff. Like, if people are having fun with it, that's, that's cool with me, right? But I'm sure they have those, those type of seasons where, like, some seasons are super hype, and then some seasons are a lot of people playing still, but a little bit more chill on that hype. You get what I'm saying? Chat knows this discussion because we've had it a few times. I... People are like, oh, I'm playing this game. It's like, great. I'm glad you're having fun. I've always enjoyed just playing games. That's what it's all about, right? Having a good time. So, anyway. Yeah. Here are three tips for every rank in Overwatch, and this is for the peeps that are in the Cheese Master rank. Tag or send this to a friend that you are shocked to see them even grace masters. Number one, drop the ego. If you're getting diffed for this instance, let's say Widow, and I'm talking you're getting 06 by her, losing every 1v1, switch and counter for the Widow. You staying and trying to get your get back is only costing you and your team lost fights, resulting in lost games. Drop the ego and switch. Trust me, I know it's rough, but you gotta do it if you really wanna rank up. Number two. Okay, first of all, I want to start off. One thing I disagree with is you have to at least start 0-7. You got to go the, the GoldenEye uh, 007 James Bond route first. Then you can make that switch. I want to point that out. You got to at least get to the, to the 007 before you make that swap. I mean, yeah, of course, like, that's going to happen. I don't think you see that happen a ton in ranked. I think sometimes, you know, the hero swaps will happen. It's not bad advice. I mean, I don't think it's like... I don't think people are going to look at that and be like, what are you talking about? I'm supposed to just get really angry and, and run at them over and over again and, and, and heck it. Like, it's my teammates. But yeah, I mean, I, I, that doesn't, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not bad, right? Whether or not people will do that, I don't know if you see that a ton in, in Masters or, well, or GM. All right, here we go. Number two, this tip may seem simple, but understand what heroes play well in what map and vice versa. That's a great, I agree. And I see you play Ryan on Crown Royale, you will immediately make me contemplate my life. Start thinking about why certain heroes play well on some maps and why some don't, and pick heroes accordingly. Too many times I'll see someone play Widow on a control point and just throw. I'm just going to pause this very quickly. This is something that you've, you've heard me talk about on stream and during spectating. I'm um, keeping in mind, and this is why this is like the, the they're calling it the master's edition of their, of their tips. Uh, keep in mind that when you're, you know, in a lot of ranks, it's not going to matter as much. But for example, you know, in top 500 games, and, 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 and you see it in master's games too. If you're playing Widow on Junkertown and you're going up against a junk rat on Junkertown, it may not go well right? Until you get to a certain spot. So what that means is as you climb, your hero selection on maps becomes more important, right? For example, you see a Widowmaker right now on this map doesn't go as well. I mean, can you, can I have, have I seen Widows win on this map? Yeah. Do we win more often against a Widow on this map? Yeah. Did Ryan's uh, always great in all maps? I, Circuit Royale is a tough one for Ryan. You can make it work, but it's, it's tough. It is tough. And people will start to name off like Reinhardt's who make him work on those maps. People who are really, 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 really good at a hero can absolutely make it work. But if you watch the play style that has to happen in there, it can still be really difficult. Circuit Royale, most Reinhardts you watch have to charge in and just like play this really aggressive play style that sometimes can be a coin flip, right? And you can argue, hey, I'll take a coin flip on Circuit Royale if you have a Rein, but sometimes it's a little bit more difficult, right? So point being is it makes sense, especially at that rank, yes. For the game whilst you can be good there's often better picks on certain maps yep. so just take this into consideration and i promise you you'll start winning more games I'm not wrong. Three, you may not notice it but your positioning could be the one thing holding you back and i'm not talking about just bad positioning but rather useless positioning let's say you're on cast sitting with your sig or arissa just shooting the enemies whenever you get the chance that can be all good and well but it's potentially useless you could be far better utilized on a flank trying to take high ground for a short period of time to make the enemy switch focus and and take their eyes off the main lane so your team can take space. Trust me, this can work wonders. Start using these three tips in your next comp games and let me know how it goes. Also, tag or send this to a friend that will probably never rank out of map. So just to point out, chat knows, I don't have to go too much further on this point. Chat knows how I feel about good position and in high ground. If <laughs> you've seen a spectating video, you know where I'm at with that one. All right, you know where I'm at with that one.
Okay, the only thing I missed about Overwatch 1 was the experimental patches made by content creators. There was one patch where Lucio was able to deal damage if he landed on someone's head with B. That was fun. And it was one of the most funniest two weeks ever because you could just take out anyone. <laughs> that if was you a good time. to take out a tank, it was possible. If you wanted to take out a fire, it was possible. Anyone, you beat on their head, you win. It was so funny. But like, they stopped doing those content creator patches. And I don't know why, because why didn't I get to do one? I would have made the funniest Lucio patch ever. Like, you know, I would have made it that he like, you know, yeah. Those patches were all for fun, man. There was nothing serious about it. But like, if I was to do something, I would make it if Lucio touches the ground at all, he just blows up and deals 500 damage to enemies and teammates. That would be peak. Uh, yeah, the, the the content creator patches were were really fun. We didn't get the we didn't get to uh to do one, and I, there would have been a lot of really fun things that could have happened. Um, and yeah, if Frogger had control of supports, I it would have been uh, quite the treat for everybody, uh, especially when you have uh, the memer side of it. I think from my understanding of it, it's because like and and I I I, I don't know if this is what happened, but I think they just like they have other stuff they're focusing on. So when they do these type of patches, it just isn't. It's just not as feasible. Even though I think it'd be great. I think this would be hilarious. I just think that it wasn't probably as feasible for them. Because it might maybe like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how that stuff works. But I don't think they'll bring these back ever again. I could be completely wrong. But the moments we did have these, it was, was, uh, was really fun. Those, those, those content creator patches were a good time. They, they were a good time. What my coffee has taught me about Overwatch. I get the same coffee every day. Two caramel, one cream. From the same Dunkin'. At the same time, every day, part of my routine. It tastes different every single time. And it's bad 90% of the time. But the 10% of the time that it's good, it's the best coffee I've ever had in my life. And that's what I realized. See, this is the thing, by the way, and I know where they're going with the dunks right here. That's why you got to find your dunks, okay? Anybody who's had dunks knows what I'm talking about. If you can find your dunks, it will be good. I have, I have a dunks that I go to that, like, 95% of the time, consistent. Every single time. Anytime I go elsewhere, 50-50. But if you find your dunks, you will have a consistent dunks when you do get it. I just want to point that out. You will have a consistent dunks. If I wanted better coffee, why don't I just change places or find a different brand or do anything, make my own coffee, try anything else? It's just like Overwatch. It's just like Overwatch. I expect the good thing, the 10%, 90% of the time, but I get the bad 90% of the time. And guess what I do? I play the same game over and over again. Please, is anybody? I mean, I'm not gonna... Listen, I'm not gonna argue with, uh, with, their, with their discussion. What is Dunks? It's Dunkin' Donuts. It's just, I call it Dunks here. All right, so people have been kind of losing their minds over this director's take. Specifically for the line, in Season 9, both tank and DPS heroes will get a modified, tuned-down version of the support, self-healing, passive. There have been a few takes on this, uh, one of the most notable being, doesn't this make shield health useless? Which, no, it actually makes shield health really fucking good, because you can regen shield and white HP at the same time, effectively giving you two passive sources of self-heal. But the more prominent one has been, this will kill the game. I'm not here to say this is a great decision or a bad decision. I'm just here to say, uh, slow your roll, people. They've said that the Season 9 balance patch is going to be a massive overhaul to the game. They've been fucking around with some really big changes in things like Quick Play Hacked and other stuff. And I think that when the comp overhaul gets introduced, they want to overhaul the rest of the game to try and address other pain points other than just the competitive player base. So I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong if you're nervous about these types of changes being implemented into the game. But I am here to say that... The Overwatch players do have a bit of a tendency to overreact to change. Like, there are still players- What do you mean? No, we don't! What do you mean? We, we never do that! Are you kidding me? What? Are you kidding me? What are you, uh, go on, Chad! No way! We don't do that! Uh, I will say, just to talk about this a little bit, Season 9 will be very interesting. Uh, and, and to talk- I've, I've been talking about this for, for weeks with the, the passive. It depends how long the passive is going to be. If the passive is much longer than the support passive, it won't be- as bad. This is just talking about that, that 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 segment right there. And I say that in the sense that if if it's much longer to get it, there's a very highly likely chance that you won't be doing it. You'll have to wait really long for that passive to kick in. Will it benefit some here? Is yes. I don't think it'll be. I don't feel like it'll be that massive on how it plays. Uh, keep in mind we have to wait and see till season nine, and then to everything else. I mean, we'll have to see. Players who lose their mind over the fact that two CP has been removed from Overwatch two. There are still players. Wait, people are, like, upset they removed 2CP? Like, a lot of people? Am I... 
motherfuckers who lose their mind over the fact that, like, push and flashpoint. Wait, let me pause for a second, by the way. Let me pause for something here about 2CP. The map aesthetics and, like, the map itself, the way they look, the way they are, are really cool, and I would love to see those back in the game again. Personally, playing 2CP in Top 500 was just, it was the absolute, it was just, it was, it was, it was tough. 2CP was not ideal. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't. It wasn't ideal. I just, just wanted to point that part out. For me, I will say the aesthetic of the maps looks really cool, and I would love to see that more. And obviously, if you like 2CP, you like 2CP. I'm not going to, you know, this wasn't, wasn't my favorite. Point exist and 2CP doesn't, or just that push and flashpoint exist, period. When the game is in this much of a shit state, just be thankful that change is happening, even if it's change you disagree with. Because a game that you disagree with the balanced direction they go forward with has more likelihood to change around and go the way you'd like it to in the future than a game that is just kind of abandoned or left stagnant. Just be more open-minded, people. And if the post says part one, it's probably not going to have all the information in it. That, that, well, that's true. I mean, I remember after that, Aaron's right. like, yeah, I think I should have not mentioned some of this in hindsight. Also, I am sure the comments look great in this. Should I take a quick gander? No, oh, actually, it isn't too bad. The first one says, uh, Junker Queen Meta, please. Okay, that was a lot. So that was surprising. All right. Unless you've been living under a rock, you may have heard Overwatch 2 is giving everyone self-healing. Not many people seem to like it, but they're kind of missing the point. It's not bad because it's more like Call of Duty, supports are going to be useless, etc. Everyone said that at the start of Overwatch 2. It's also probably going to be pretty weak. The real problem is that we have another thing that will need to be balanced. The current role passives... Wait, just to pause for a second, your supports are healing you? I, and I don't say that as in supports don't heal. I just, in top 500, it's just everybody goes like BAP, like BAP Ayari now. And you just, you just, it's like everybody has 10,000 damage with 7,000 healing. Roadhog's the number one heal, like the number one support in the, in the game. <laughs> no, I, I know, I know as a support you, yeah, you get healed by them. It's more along the memes of like, if Chad has seen the top 500 games and, and don't get me wrong. Obviously, if you've seen the spectating series, like I know it plays a lot differently with how it will be. Ooh, but let me tell you what. I, it is just, every support has 12,000 damage, and I'm like, well, that was fun. I, I have to have them just spin around in circles. That's my gameplay on tank. <laughs> ...aren't tailored to each hero. <clears throat> and if you saw the recent horse buffs, sojourn buffs, past year of patches, you'll know that if something actually needs to be balanced in Overwatch 2, it's going to stay that way. But wait. They said a huge balance patch is coming alongside it. If you mean to tell me they've been hoarding up good balance decisions for season nine of the game, you haven't been paying attention. But if that is true, I guess we're back to hoarding up content for the core Overwatch fan experience of waiting for shit to get better. And I want to be wrong on this one. How do you feel about it? I have to stop for one second on that one just because it reminds me of Overwatch 1 where it was just like, there was nothing there. I mean, there was just like not any updates forever. It really depends how major the changes are. I think if they end up being major changes, then like it's probably something they couldn't just kind of like sprinkle into the game. And I think that's what we'll have to see with Season 9 because if it's a lot of stuff, then they can't just like sprinkle that in, you know, over like Season 7, Season 8. It has to, if there's a lot of major things changing, then it's probably not as like, Simple as like, oh, we're just saving this up for this specifically. It's it, it means it's generally an overall larger change to everything happening, right? You get what I'm saying? Big slam! I don't buy what? Yeah, even a tank. Well, I hear you are on it, uh, bro. It, look, look. It, it says that I'm contesting. Uh, it says that I'm contesting. I need to watch this one more time. I need to see something. Wasn't on the point. All right, so we'll talk about this very quickly. And this is a change they made very recently. I don't know why they did this. So the change they made is that the game ends not as quickly as it used to. So you think that you still have time to be on the cart because the game is, is still going, but the game has already ended. So your feedback to it is like, what is happening? So if you look up top, by the way, watch this. They're not on the point. Already the cart is done. Look up top. Do you see how it says unspecified? The game is already over. The game's already over at this point, and they were off the, and, and was off the cart to begin with. But your feedback to it is you're on the cart, and you're still there because the game doesn't end. So now watch. Watch what happens to the game now. And it didn't used to be like this. It used to just end, and you would know the game was over. And out of nowhere, they made this swap that gives you this feedback here every time. Watch. See? 0.52 meters. Game's over. See that? 0.52 meters, not on the cart range. You can see where the cart would be, right? Game's over. But watch how long the game goes for. See? It went an extra three seconds or so. 
where it, you thought you were still playing, but the game was already over, and they just wait to tell you it's over. So that's what happened right there. It happens to me all the time. All the time that happens to me, and I don't know why they made that change to it, but like it, it, makes, it makes the feedback of an end of a game so much worse because you think you're still playing well and making a play, but the game is already over according to the game. So that, that's why it does that. Trust me, I've been down that road of looking through that, and that's what it is. Six heroes, two. Six heroes to avoid when you want to rank up. Two <laughs> tanks, two DPS, and two supports. First, for tank, it's ball and run. If you play ball and you think you're gonna win, you're just fucking wrong. Ryan, on the other hand, isn't super bad in low ranks and actually is pretty good. And from bronze to gold, he works fine, but other than that, he sucks. The fact that Widowmaker has a lot of damage drop off now is just sad, and you're probably not good enough to carry with her either. The same with Genji, he requires a lot of effort to get value, and he just isn't worth it. For supports, it's Moira and Ilari. Like with Moira, why would you ever play a heal botting DPS support? First of all, I gotta pause for a second, and I think my favorite part about this whole video is someone running around as Cassidy as like the as the gameplay uh, in the background, knowing that Cassidy's been in this like very unique spot where it's really hard to play Cass while also just right click Randy and everybody. Like out of all heroes to showcase during this, no more is a heal bot in DPS. Apparently, does all of that. Uh, keep in mind, I, I want to point this out, uh, and, and I'll disagree slightly on the Moira side of things. I you can Moira, you can probably play from bronze to top 500 no problem i'm gonna give you the reason why people go with this with moira it's the play style on moira some people find difficulty in finding that balance on moira of being able to both heal your team and do damage it generally turns into you have a moira who either only heals or you have a moira who's decided that if they heal you it's because the the healing orb they threw to save themselves bounced off the wall and went to the team on accident right and even then they're lucky if you get that healing orb out and i think that's kind of where that happens with support with Moira is that it's just the play style of a lot of Moiras is just not, it's just, it's either or. So, oh no, I know that damage and heals are both high in Moira. That's what I'm saying. You probably can play Moira from bronze to top 500. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Moira is probably going to be fine with that. She has no other value. For Ilari, it's just that you need such a high skill to be able to get value with her that it's just not worth it unless you're diamond or above. I mean, I, I feel like yeah, some of those heroes you can probably play. I think some of those heroes will take time to get good at. The Moira one I just slightly disagree with because I, I know that like I, I even like I, I see what happens when I go up against like a good Moira and like how frustrating that can be experience wise. It doesn't mean that Moira is amazing by any means. Like if you have an Honor Brig Winston comp, like more than likely the Moira comp will lose, right? But you can still make it work if your team isn't playing perfect, right? It, that that's top five hundred like perfect gameplay, and that's if you have like a lobby of people taking it seriously. If you want to know how to have crazy good comms on tank, check out this clip. I'm watching touch. You know, it, uh, just to go back to that very quickly, good comms, good comms are good, 100%. I, I cannot disagree with that. I like the, I like the comms there. Uh, one thing I want to point out, one thing I want to point out, by the way, is I absolutely love the Ramatra gameplay of what happens in like scrims or like really good like rank games where you just hold right click. That's it. Although when I try holding right click as uh, as Ramatra in top 500 games right now, I still fall over. But I also will say my Ramatra isn't the best right now. Actually, believe it or not, I have a bit to go on my Ramatra. Not from a mechanical point of view, like the aim and like understanding stuff. It's more about my timings. But yeah, yeah. I mean, those are those are comms that you'll see. I think some actually for for pro player comms that also might even be a bit more relaxed than some you'll see in some comms. Like very like really, if you've seen some of like the OWL listens and sometimes you'll hear like very aggressive comms like. Uh, 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 tracer, 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 tracer. Like you'll hear like really, really, really uh, quick ones, but these are good comps. So there's a, a couple of different variations you'll see. Overwatch Pet Peeves, Episode 1.
Let's find out. Watch Pet Peeves, episode one. I'm doing good about you. Don't think about support LOS and then flame supports. You know, as a support main, I had to start with this one. We have all had those moments where our Reinhardt charges in behind three walls and then starts flaming supports after they die. I have to admit, this is one I used to be guilty of. I would rush around corners and die and yep. then go, where are my supports? Why aren't you with me? And Anna would say, I'm positioned in the back. I can't follow you there. And I'd be like, well, it's your job to follow me. Tank, <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but it's not a support's job to kill themselves to save your life. And to all of the I feel like, I always do love that concept when a Reinhardt charges behind and then says it's your job to follow the Rhine in. Out of curiosity, like out of curiosity, what do you expect if you're a Reinhardt and you charge in behind the team? Like, what supports are you expecting to go in with you? Like, even if, like, you charge into a team and a Kiriko teleports to you, like, you are not going for the best result on that one. And keep in mind, if you've watched the Spectating series, we've talked about this a lot, right? Where always, and, and, you, and if you watched, like, when we did the SVB thing too, always have an idea of the LOS of your supports. Otherwise, it will not go well. And if you blame your supports for that, that's going to be more on you as a tank playing two aggro. And you'll see me doing a top 500, I'll go, that's on me. I didn't look where my supportive line of sight was. Even though, even if they weren't telling me that, it takes me like a tenth of a second to understand their sight lines and then not push past those. And if I do, understand where I have to fall back to, right? So, I mean, yeah, I can see why people would not like that. The support mains I've complained to over the years, this is my formal apology. <laughs> Next up, we have people who complain about you practicing a character in quick play. This is one I never really understood. If you can't practice a hero in quick play, where are you supposed to practice them? You can't say arcade because that's just not anywhere near the same as comp. You aren't just learning how to press your buttons. You're learning to position, how to play around certain heroes on your team, how to deal with certain team comps. None of that is something you're going to learn in the 3v3 elims. I think it's important that people actually try in their quick play games. You don't need to sweat, but at the end of the day, nobody wants a teammate who's trolling. But that doesn't mean you can't practice heroes you're not good with. And I think that I want to point out the point that was made here. Uh, which I think ended up being the, the better part of the point, is that you can still try and learn new heroes in quick play while also trying in quick play. As in, like, you're still given effort, right? It's like, I think that's kind of where, like, the, the, the point kind of hits a bit more, is, like, in quick play, when you're learning a new hero, you can still put effort into that game. And that's what they were saying. Like, you're not just going to go in there and just, and just meme it, right? Oh, yeah, no, I've seen, I've seen the argument. Someone said, like, the, the, you don't need to ever go into quick play to learn a new hero because you have the practice range. And I'm just like, the practice range is good for some things, but if you're expecting somebody to go into the hero and become, a, like, an absolute dominant hero because of the practice range, then I, I, I don't know what to say at that point. If everybody had, the, like, the, the, the hitbox size of, like, Roadhog, because if you've seen the training range bots, I think it's larger than the, the Roadhog hitbox, to point that out. You're, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna, everything's gonna look amazing at that point when you're just sitting there shooting against bots that have these hitboxes like the size of a Reinhardt shield. Anyway. That's the entire point of the game mode. If you want people to swap for you, go play comp, and even then, don't expect it. The way Blizzard treats win rates is gospel when it comes to balance. This is something I really agree with, and I want to explain why with a quick example. Throughout almost every season of Overwatch, Symmetra has had one of the best win rates in the game. She's currently the third highest win rate over the last three months, right under Mauga and Brig. Now, if I asked you if Symmetra was strong, you would probably tell me no. So why does Symmetra have this win rate? It's simple. She's a very strong niche pick, and people only play her in those niches. If you're on Li Jiang and you have a Symmetra TPing you to point, your chances of winning are simply higher. And outside of these scenarios, a lot of people just don't play Symmetra at all. So even though Symmetra might not be strong, her win rates have always been high. I think Blizzard really needs to start evaluating why heroes have the win rates they do, rather than just handing out buffs and nerfs based on those win rates. If you'd like to submit your own pet peeves, you can do so by leaving a comment or joining the Discord in my bio. This we'll look at the comments here in a second. I do want to say, as far as I understand, and, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think some sites that show the data on on like win rates and pick rates doesn't quite show the full picture of what they'll have because private profiles, if I'm correct, aren't picked up on those websites. And I think private profiles are also the default setting. So you're probably missing a lot of data from that. I could be, I, keep in mind, I could be completely wrong on that one. And I, I, maybe it's not default now for private profiles, but I think you can't grab the data if people don't go on there or if the private profile is on, which is the default. So a lot of players probably just leave it on and not even realize it. Um, that doesn't mean that it can't give you, like, it doesn't mean it can't tell you a little bit of the story with, like, win rates. It just, it's not the full one on that one. Another argument they have is that they sometimes try to, f try to find that balance between, like, if a hero has a high win rate in this rank, but a really bad win rate in these ranks, what do they do? And I think a perfect example of a hero that you see do that is constantly Sojourn and Kiriko. How Kiriko and Sojourn constantly seem to get these type of buffs. And then you go, why? And then what happens is it's because the win rates are really low in some ranks and really high in others. And I actually think Kiriko's win rate actually wasn't even that high in top. I mean, I could be wrong. I think it was a little bit lower than people expected, even though Kiriko is still good. 
I, I think that, I think that was actually I think the reason why that happened was because a lot of comps were playing. And then there's unmirrored win rates too. So unmirrored win rates are a little bit different. So mirrored win rates are irrelevant, not irrelevant, but like mirrored win rates 50-50, right? But like unmirrored win rates is when that hero is the only one on the team against other heroes who are not there. So there's a lot of different stuff there. But yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting with that balance philosophy on that stuff, but it's so hard to say without having the full numbers and details because I just don't, I don't have that same data that they're, they're going to have. You know what I mean? So here we go. Nick Genji. Go in, go in fast. What? What? Oh my god. <laughs> stop laughing, stop laughing. No, Genji. Go in, go in fast. Yeah, I think I think I agree. I think nerf Genji is the correct play. I don't get how it didn't get the What? What? Oh my god. Stop laughing! Stop laughing! Yeah, I mean, I think everybody agrees. Nerf Genji, right? Oh, that's great. I love that. That's a is that a classic? Actually, it's the first time I've ever seen that one. By the way, that's the first time I've ever seen that one. Oh, same map. We have a Hanzo. A lot of people suggest that they should just add a five v five and six v six game mode in Overwatch, so you can let the player choose which mode they want to play. This might surprise you, considering my take on five v five versus six v six, but I think that's a terrible idea. And there's a few reasons for that. One of the biggest ones is balance. Balancing for five v five and balancing mm -hmm. for six v six is much different. And I really do not think that they have the capability to balance two different games on their own. And that's effectively what 5v5 and 6v6 is. They are kind of two different games. They do play very differently. So I believe the balance would just be a I mean, it would be. to pull That's why they had to rebalance a little bit. could be completely different in one mode versus the other. So I think that it's better that they just stick to one, even if that is just 5v5. And another reason mm -hmm. is it just splits the player base. Oh, yeah. Not only would you just have increased queue times because less people are playing that specific game mode, but knowing the way that the Overwatch community is, I know for a fact there would be a big superiority complex based Based on which mode you played. I know for a fact that there would be those people like, huh, oh, you're masters in 5v5? Oh, so you mean you're plat in 6v6? <laughs> like, it, everyone would just be so cringe and corny about it. And Doesn't that already happen with open queue and roll queue, by the way? I guess that already a thing. Like, <laughs> isn't that like, I feel like that's already a, like a, a thing in, a, in open queue and all that. Like, it's just, yeah, oh yeah, by the way. Like, like oh yeah, you got it on that one? And this already happens with open queue. I play open queue. I find it much more oh. enjoyable <laughs> than roll lock. So in some of my videos, all <laughs> I love that timing. He goes, oh, yeah, that happens in open queue. I was gonna say that I knew that was there had to be a reason as to why that was brought up. I, I could I I right away. I knew that's what it was gonna be. Use open queue gameplay, and people will be like, "Oh, you're playing open queue. Uh, your opinion is invalid," as if that has anything to do with the point of my video. So overall, I think having a five v five and six v six game mode is a pretty brain dead idea. Honestly, they just need to stick to one. And if it's five v five, then so be it. Yeah, you I don't want you don't want to do the five v five six v six thing with that stuff. I, I feel like that would be it, it's exactly right in the sense that you would end up splitting up a lot of the player base to begin with. So yeah, this is the last one of this video. So get ready. Here we go. Top five Overwatch streamers from someone that watches way too much Twitch. At number five, we have Flats. Flats is the Overwatch streamer. He's the best streamer to watch for drops, and you'll probably get to see some really funny gameplay. Uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to drops, everybody, you know where to... No, I'm just kidding. Um, not... You gotta love Flats. Flats is our, our great friend, all right? We love Flats. At number four, we have Aspen. Aspen great streamer. Is an ex Overwatch contenders player. Aspen's who hilarious. Support. Also, her, her new cat's awesome. Is very distinct from Froggers and Escape because she actually plays for a team. She also has some really funny facial expressions that make her stream a funny watch. At number three, we have Raylene. Raylene is the current top 500 support and an amazing anime. If you're looking to have a good conversation in the stream, her chat is the best one for it. At number two, we have Ski SD. A top 500 Mercy Mafia member who does educational content as well as entertainment. Yeah. She has a very yeah, wholesome community and is the Heck best yeah. content creator. Yeah, to so watch far, so far, like everybody in this list has been awesome. Number one, we have I, with, Imong. He's I mean, uh, don't even. Uh, me? I mean, I. No. There's just no pre watch. No, I, don't, I actually don't watch any of these. Now, it doesn't mean that Aw Crap, who, who created this list, didn't know that it was going to be me at number one in this one. I'm just gonna head back here, chat. One second. Entertainment. <sighs> she has a very wholesome community, and is the best content creator to watch for learning mercy. At number one, we have. E why is why is out of all the why is this the the image out of everything else? You know, this TikTok video is how you actually found me. How, how come out of all of the images we have, we get one with anything else? This is the one that was chosen. I just need I need I need. I'm just curious on this one. 
Out of every single one! Alright, here we go. Imong, he's a top 500 tank with a very wholesome personality. He makes it very easy to get hyped up to play Overwatch and probably has one of the best divas in the top 500 leaderboard. Name some of your favorite Overwatch Twitch streamers down below. I mean, listen, I, you know, I, I, I also always wonder when someone, like, when, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Also, great top five list there. If everybody hasn't checked out everybody there, make sure to do so. One thing I will say, hopefully it's a good thing that I get you to want to play Overwatch sometimes. Like, I can imagine it now. Like, you know what? I'm, I'm feeling hyped up to go play some Overwatch. Thank you. Right, let's go. Let's get into play Overwatch. You load into a ranked game. What the? You kidding me? You got me to play Overwatch? What the? I'm just saying, hopefully it's a good thing, right? If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button. Subscribe to all three YouTubes if you haven't. We are looking for people to submit TikTok reacts on my Discord. Follow the rules. It makes it easier to be able to do TikTok reacts when people are submitting them. So on my Discord, you can submit TikToks there. Just to point out, by the way, that doesn't mean just submit a random TikTok like music video. People have taken the TikTok react channel as like, go post a music video of like a new hit release. We're looking for Overwatch 2 TikTok reacts. We record these live on streams. Look in the description below. You'll see my Discord. And if you look at the chat below, that's Twitch chat. We have a lot of fun here. Stop by if you haven't. With that being said, hope you all have an amazing day slash night.